Well, the next milestone for Gemini was rendezvous. One of the most important goals of the Gemini program. And uh, that was uh, the goal for Gemini 6, commanded by Mercury veteran Wally Schra and co-pilot rookie from the second astronaut group, Tom Stafford. Um, they had uh, probably, this was considered the, the plum mission of Gemini, the first rendezvous. Um, it meant having to master the uh, very arcane uh, techniques of, of flying uh, in orbit with the, the laws of orbital motion, orbital mechanics, very counterintuitive compared to uh, flying an airplane. You can't just point yourself at the target and, and uh, fire your engine because you'll find out that that doesn't get you where you think it's going to. Uh, objects that are orbiting the Earth or any other body behave according to a very intricate set of rules in which uh, your speed is directly linked with your height and so by adding or subtracting velocity you also change your altitude but then that affects your speed and so on and so forth so not at all a simple thing but by the time they were ready to go in October of 1965 Sharon and Stafford were definitely ready and uh, the plan was that they would launch uh, after an unmanned target rocket called an Agena which was a top and atlas booster, was launched ahead of them in its own orbit. They would then launch in the Gemini and fly the necessary maneuvers to link up with, actually rendezvous with, and then actually dock with the Agena. Uh, Shara and Stafford were in the spacecraft ready to launch on October 25th when the Agena left the launch pad and headed for space, but it didn't last very long. It exploded during the launch, and that meant that Gemini 6's launch had to be scrubbed. And you can see on the left there, a very disappointed Shara and Stafford are leaving the launch pad and uh, getting ready to go back to the crew quarters at the Cape. Uh, but it didn't take long for the NASA managers to come up with a very neat and very bold plan to recover from this. Gemini 6 would still carry out the rendezvous, but instead of rendezvousing with an unmanned target rocket, they would in fact rendezvous with the next Gemini mission, Gemini 7, which was slated to be launched in December and was the long duration space marathon of Gemini in which uh, the two astronauts would double, almost double the Gemini 5 record of eight days and extend that out to 14 days. So the plan was that they would launch Gemini 7 and then during that flight, um, Gemini 6 would be launched on its own trajectory and meet up with Gemini 7 and that would accomplish the rendezvous. They would then leave the docking, the link up maneuver to a later mission. Well, so all eyes turned to Gemini 7 and the crew for that mission were two rookies from the second astronaut group, Frank Borman and Jim Lovell. And they, because they were going to be up for 14 days if everything held out, um, they had a new kind of spacesuit that was supposed to be more comfortable uh, because they were not going to have to uh, perform any spacewalks, uh, they um, did not need the same uh, kind of rigid space helmet and uh, insulation layers and so forth. They just needed something that could handle uh, keeping uh, pressure in case the cabin depressurized, that they could uh, survive a cabin depressurization in, in that event. And uh, these uh, soft spacesuits would do the job. Uh, so there they are on the left, leaving the uh, suit-up van, uh, looking rather strange, even for uh, guys in spacesuits. And um, they launched on December 4th, 1965. And uh, if the rendezvous mission was considered the plum flight uh, for the astronauts of Gemini, well, this was definitely not the plum mission. In fact, 
most of the guys considered it kind of the dregs mission. Um, but Frank Borman was determined to carry it out and to get through that 14 days. And he was a very, uh, very disciplined, very uh, hard driving military guy. Uh, of course, uh, most of the guys were still active military, but Borman really fit the part of the military commander. And Jim Lovell uh, was very easygoing, also very determined, very competitive. And together they were, uh, they were pretty determined to make it through that 14 days. You can see on the right, during the flight, Frank Borman is participating in one of many medical experiments. This was primarily a medical flight, which of course was one of the reasons the astronauts were not exactly thrilled about flying it. Um, and uh, they put up with it, of course. They knew it was important for the program. But again, think about spending two weeks in that cramped Gemini cockpit with uh, everything crammed into uh, little uh, crevices and storage lockers. All the food was kept behind the couches. Not exactly fun. So you can imagine that they were looking forward to seeing their colleagues on Gemini 6 join them in space. That was supposed to happen um, about halfway through the flight, a little more than halfway through the flight. And uh, Sharon and Stafford climbed into uh, Gemini 6. They got into the got into the spacecraft. They were sitting atop the Titan rocket. Countdown went down to zero. The engines lit. The clock started inside the spacecraft, which is one of the most key signals that the flight has begun. But the engines shut down moments later. Now, the big uncertainty was... Had the engines been burning long enough for the booster to rise off the pad? If that were the case, then Shira would have to pull the ring on the ejection seat and blast them out of there. And uh, that was not something that anybody looked forward to doing. But uh, if the rocket were going to fall back to the pad and explode, he would have no other choice. But he could tell that there was no motion, the rocket had not been moving, he did not feel any vibration, he did not feel any sense of acceleration or leaving the pad, and he decided to stay where they were and not pull the ejection seat. And uh, that move probably saved their lives, him and Stafford, but it also certainly made it possible to turn around and have a new launch attempt just a couple of days later. And uh, just to show you what's uh, involved with this ejection business, um, here's the uh, film of uh, pulling the ring, and here's a test uh, ejection, uh, not with uh, astronauts, but with a couple of dummies in suits on these ejection seats going high-speed film showing them rocketing out of the spacecraft. Now, this is all well and good, but the problem was that if you had to eject from a Titan rocket from a Gemini spacecraft that was going at a, a over two times the speed of sound and maybe 100,000 feet up, that was not something that the astronauts thought that they could survive. Gemini, of course, had no escape tower, so the ejection seats were the only means of escape. But that kind of a situation to eject at uh, 100,000 feet in Mach 2, and maybe you'd even end up flying through the flame of your own Titan booster as you shot out of there. This was not something that the astronauts were anxious to do, and Dick Gordon, who uh, ended up flying on Gemini 11, said, uh, uh, and one time talking to me about it, I wasn't going to pull that ring. Somebody else was going to have to do it. So it was a very good thing that Shira and Stafford did not have to eject. And uh, in fact, no one did have to eject in the entire Gemini program, and the Gem the NASA managers breathed a great sigh of relief when the last Gemini mission was over, and they realized that they never had to use those ejection seats.